Department of Physics, Swiss, Hyderabad. So he did postdoc at Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, and also at National University of Singapore. He did PhD in physics from Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, from 2002 to 2007. He did MSc in physics from Sri Venkateswara University, Andhra, Andhra Pradesh, from 2002 to 2002. His research interests include magnetic thin films and nanostructures, micromagnetic simulations, magnetic schemas, sorry, spintronics, magnetic sensors for non-destructive testing of materials. He has a sponsored project titled Development of Magneto Impedance Sensor for Bio, bio Cell Sim Detections, Bio Cell Detection, funded by DSC Cell. Worth of 22.68 lakhs. So he, he published more than 15 journal, uh, publications, 15 articles in international journals. And he has many, uh, he, he is life member, lifetime member of Magnetics Society of India. So he received Professor P. Jairam Reddy gold medal for university first in MSc physics, Sri Venkateswara University. So he also received Professor B.B. B. B. Nagiretti Prize for University First in MSc Physics, Sri Venkateshwar University. He also received Mrs. Sita Gopala Krishnan Prize for University First in MSc Physics, Sri Venkateshwar University. And also S.A. Ramurthy Foundation Award for College First in BSc. With this brief introduction, I request the speaker of the session to give Okay, good morning to all of you. Can you hear me? So, thank you, sir, for your kind introduction. So, first of all, Thanks for the organizers for giving me this, uh, this opportunity to deliver a lecture on thin film technology in this prestigious IEEE nanotechnology work uh, school. So before going to the talk, just I will uh, briefly explain uh, what we are doing at BITS and what research we are doing. And then I'll go directly going to the talk. Okay. So Bitspilani, it is started in the uh, 1900s right, as a school, and later it is uh, developed into an engineering college and then a team to be university. So now Bitspilani, all over India, it has four campuses. So main campus is in Pilani, and Goa, Hyderabad, and recently one campus started in Mumbai, but it offers only MBA. So uh, I am working in Bitspilani Hyderabad campus in Department of Physics. Right. So in Department of Physics, we have both theoretical and experimental group. So I am an experimental uh, uh, in the experimental group. So in the experimental group, we have uh, people working on sol uh, solar cells, right, and the microfluidics, DNA nanoelectronics, ferroelectrics magnetic materials, etc. So I worked on magnetic materials. So my research uh, area or my research interest is soft magnetic thin films and nanostructures.
So mainly I work on soft magnetic thin films and nanostructures. So in addition to this, uh, so the fabrication of uh, magnetic thin films by sputtering unit. And then so the study of magnetic nanostructures using micromagnetic simulations. And recently we started this magnetic skirmions, right? So they are uh, surface defects, right? And uh, spintronics. So spintronics is analogous to electronics. So where the spin of the electron is used instead of the charge of the electrons. And then magnetic sensors and transducers for identity of uh, applications, entity applications. So, uh, so at present, uh, these students are working under me. So, one is working on magnetic cast sensors, and two are working on these magnetic skirmions. Right. So, recently we published a paper in Nature Scientific Reports on magnetic skirmions. So, coming to the facilities available. So, in this, most of the facilities they are central facilities. For all for the entire campus. So we have DC and RF magnetron sputtering system and thermal ion operation, electron beam operation, and characterization techniques like XRD, SEM, XPS. So we have FTAR, impedance analyzer up to three gigahertz, U visual spectrometer, DSC, and high performance computing facility for uh, running the micromagnetic simulations. So in this most of the, uh, almost all, all our central facilities, only the DC sputtering unit is in our physics lab. So this is briefly about our research, what we are doing at BITS. So coming to the outline of my talk, so the talk is mainly on thin film nanotechnology, right? So first I will uh, discuss so whether thin films they come under nanomaterials or not, right? So if they come under nanomaterials, what is the proof? So, so we'll discuss confinement and what are quantum wells, quantum dots, and quantum wires. After this, I will go to the uh, preparation techniques. So just before preparation, we need to create some vacuum, right? So what is vacuum and what system we can use for creating vacuum? So we have to use rotary pump, diffusion pump. Briefly, I will explain. Uh, I will not go into detail, but briefly, I will explain what is rotary pump, what is its working principle. In the same way, diffusion pump, what is its working principle. After this, I will go to the deposition techniques. So deposition techniques, many techniques are there. So broadly, we can divide them into two categories. One is vapor phase, and the other one is liquid phase. So vapor phase, again, we have. Uh, physical and chemical. So I am going to concentrate only on the physical deposition techniques like vacuum operation, sputtering, PLD and MBE, molecular beam, f taxi. So after this, so how to measure the thickness? What is DTM, digital thickness monitor? Right? So these are the topics that I'm going to cover. So thin film, so all of you know thin film. What is a thin film? How we can define a thin film? So it is a it can be a solid film or liquid film. Right? The only thing is we have to see what is the thickness. Yeah. So it can be a solid or liquid material. So only the thickness, the thickness from microns to down to few angstroms, right? So if it is a micron film, we call it as a thick film. Otherwise, uh, we call it as a thin film. So thin film's main application is, uh, so they miniaturize the sensors or users that we use. So they have plenty of applications. Some of these applications are here. So they can be used as sensors, solar cells, a lot of you know solar cells, right? Silicon thin film or silicon hydrogen thin film, etc. And so the reflective layers on DVDs, Blu ray, series, so they are thin films. And the uh, magnetic uh, hard disk, right? So hard disk also contains a film, which is a magnetic film. So that film, it stores the data as 1010 in the bit, bit form. And the read head, 
read head write head everything it is a hello so uh, these are the uh, briefly what is film and what are its applications so uh, as i told you thin films so they are nanomaterials or not right so thin films they come under nanomaterials so if they come under nanomaterials so how we can uh, define so that whether it is a nano or not so for that we need to know what is confinement right so confinement it comes under Quantum. So quantum physics. <clears throat> so in nanometers, we um, frequently hear this word confinement, right? So confinement means reducing the dimensions to the nano scale. So if you reduce the dimensions to a nano scale, what happens? The properties they change, right? So why the properties they change? So we can explain the properties they change because of the broken translation symmetry and so increase in surface to volume ratio and there is a surface area increase right and also the dimensions they are comparable to the characteristic length scales so some length scales are there if you go below certain dimensions so these length scales they are uh, define they define the properties of the materials right suppose if you take uh, magnetic materials so the ferromagnetism it comes because of the exchange interaction so the exchange interaction is so between two spins. So what is the separation between these two spins? That defines the length scale. So these length scales they are different for different materials. So if you oh, if you take the bulk material, so in the case of bulk material, so there is a translation symmetry. So the atoms, the repetition of atoms, it will be there in all the three directions x, y, and z. And if you reduce one of the dimension to the nano scale, right, then what you get is a two dimensional picture. And if you reduce one more dimension, dimension, right, so what you get is a wire. And if you reduce one more dimension, what you get is a dot or a particle, right? So, so the first one is the bulk. So here there is no confinement. So there is no broken translational symmetry. So there is no confinement. And if you come to the 2D plane, right? So the uh, here the uh, it is a 1D confinement, right? So it is a one-dimensional confinement. Means so one of the dimension is reduced to the nano scale, right? So if you reduce one of the dimension to the nano scale, then what happens? So there is a broken translation symmetry. So because of a broken translation symmetry, the energy level distribution that changes so how it changes i will show you and so this is a 2d confinement in two of the dimensions are reduced to the nano scale and this one is a 3d confinement three dimensions x y z all the three dimensions are reduced to the nano scale what you get is quantum dot so our thin films they come under this 1d confinement so one of the dimension is reduced to the nano scale so if you Confine this so uh, confinement means so the uh, movement of the electron along that direction is confined. So it is confined to its de Broglie wavelength or excite on bore radius. So then what happens? The energy levels. So this is the density of states variation. So the energy levels they become discrete along that direction. So if you have bulk materials, so you have distribution continuous distribution of energy levels, which is a parabolic variation. And if you go for 1D confinement, 2D confinement, and 3D confinement, the energy levels distribution they change. Right? And so if it is a 3D material, which is a bulb, so there is no confinement. That means all the three directions, the electron it can freely move. So the degrees of freedom in the case of 3D means bulk material are free. And for 1D confinement, so the degrees of freedom are two only one dimension is reduced to the nano level and in the plane so you have continuous distribution of energy levels so it is a uh, two degree it has two degrees of freedom and for quantum wire it has only one degree of freedom and for quantum dot zero degrees of freedom so our thin films they come under 
nanotechnology or nanomaterials. So that's why the name thin film nanotechnology or thin film technology. So we can use ultimately. So the properties of the films, right? So when we fabricate the films, so the properties they depend on these things. So the method of deposition and substrate material. So which substrate we use glass or silicon or germanium and the substrate temperature. So when we are depositing the film substrate, we can heat it or we can deposit at ambient temperature. So that uh, substrate temperature also changes the properties and the rate of deposition of fast we are depositing and the background pressure. So what is the pressure inside the chamber? So all these things, they affect the properties of the films. So if you see uh, the background pressure and the rate of deposition, right? So, so, <coughs> so the first one, it depends on the method and second and third depends on the temperature and substrate. And the last two, right? So rate of deposition and the background pressure. So depends on what is the vacuum inside the chamber. So uh, in all the physical vapor deposition method before going to deposit the films, so we had to create the vacuum. So what is vacuum? So vacuum is nothing but so removal of gas molecules. So we had to remove the gases that are present inside the chamber. So we need vacuum. So why we need vacuum? So vacuum is a space from which air and other gas molecules they can be removed. And right. So uh, we need vacuum to create. So why we need vacuum? So to create vacuum, uh, to create vacuum, we need vacuum pump. So that vacuum pump contains walls, pumps, and correctors, etc. And then, so if you see the units, so normally vacuum is nothing but pressure, right? So if you remove the gas molecules, that means we are decreasing the pressure. So we have to measure what is the pressure inside the chamber. So the units normally we use Pascal's or Newton per meter square, atmospheric pressure or bar, torque, etc. So if you see for Pascal's, so these these are used for high pressures. Pascal's Newton per, Newton per meter square atmosphere, etc. So the vacuum levels, so we indicate using bar and top. Right? So these also we can use Pascal's Newton per meter square, but they are they are higher or bigger values. Right? So that's why uh, we use them for indicating high pressures, and these two for the low pressures means vacuum. So why we need to create vacuum? So we need vacuum for the deposition of films. So why means, so if we have a high pressure inside the chamber, then whatever the material that we are evaporating or sputtering, so those atoms and molecules, right? So they have to go and stick to the substrate. So with some energy. So if you have high pressure inside the chamber, then what happens? So they lose their kinetic energy because of the collisions with the gas molecules inside the chamber and so they will not have sufficient energy to sit on the substrate so we will not get the film so that's this is one reason so to get this line of sight deposition so we need this so line of sight deposition means directly from target to the substrate so we need vacuum and the other reason is to for avoiding the contamination so if vacuum is there so then the foreign atoms also they sit on the substrate. So you'll have contamination, you'll have voids, etc. So to avoid that, we need vacuum. Okay, so we need vacuum. Next, how to create this vacuum? So to create this vacuum, we need some vacuum system. Right? So what is that vacuum? Okay. Uh, so before going to the vacuum system, so there are different levels of vacuum. So rough vacuum medium vacuum, high vacuum, ultra high vacuum. So now you can see the difference between Pascal and this torque, right? So at high pressures, 
So this this pascals they, they, the number it will be very high. So that's why for tor and bar we use to indicate the level of vacuum. So the level of vacuum, right? It depends on the application and the method that we use. So normally uh, in labs, so we use medium or high vacuum to deposit the fillets and ultra high vacuum. So we use when we go for molecular view attacks. Yeah. <laughs> so to create the vacuum, we need vacuum pumps. So the vacuum pumps, there are different types of vacuum pumps like gas. So the mainly they can be divided into two. So one is gas transfer pumps and the entrapment pumps. So gas transfer pumps, again, we have positive displacement pump and kinetic pump. And positive displacement pumps, again, many are there. Similarly, kinetic pumps, many are there. But uh, the systems that we use in our lab, they are rotary pump, diffusion pump, turbo molecular pump, and cryo pump. So these are the four things normally we use in the labs, research labs. Right, so the rotary pump, this gives the rough vacuum and uh, diffusion pump and turbo molecular pump, they give the high vacuum. And cryo pump, it gives ultra high vacuum, but the vacuum creation volume it is very less. So normally cryo pumps, so we use for uh, attaining low temperatures like 10 Kelvin or 4 Kelvin using closed cycle refrigerators, right? So uh, I briefly explain you what is rotary pump and how it creates vacuum. So it creates the rough vacuum and then so the diffusion pump, so which gives a high vacuum. Turbo molecular pump and cryo pump I'm not going because these are the two systems uh, are used for uh, in any uh, coating units, right? Depositing uh, units. Yeah. So the gas transfer pumps, right? So and <coughs> entrapment pumps. So the gas transfer pumps. So you have uh, displacement pumps and other one is uh, kinetic pump. So displacement pump, the name itself tell you the gas it is displaced, right? It displaces the gas molecules. And rotary pump is the example. And kinetic pumps, right? It transfers the gas molecules from inside the chamber to outside by momentum transfer or energy transfer. That's why the name kinetic pump. So the diffusion pump and turbo molecular pump. And this one, entrapment pump, it traps the gas molecules. It, so that it absorbs the gas molecules on the walls. Right? So that's why the name entrapment. Yeah, this is the vacuum system normally. So in this vacuum system, this is the rotary pump. And what we have is the diffusion pump, right? So these two are to connect in series. And uh, so these are the vacuum gauges and valves. So above this, if you keep the chamber and power supply, what you get is the coating unit, thin film deposition unit. So the rotary pump is the basic pump that we need to create a uh, vacuum. So if you want to go for medium vacuum, high vacuum, and ultra high vacuum, the first thing what we need is the rotary pump. So this creates the rough vacuum. So the pressure range here it is 760 torr to 10 power minus 3 torr. So the maximum vacuum level that we get using rotary pump is 10 power minus 3 torr. So this is the rough vacuum. And so this is a positive displacement pump. So it displaces the gas molecule from chamber to the atmosphere. How it displaces? So it will have some uh, rotor and a stator, right? So the rotor also contains some wheels and a spring attachment. So when this rotor rotates, right? So these wheels, right? So they are they touch the uh, this stator. They 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 are in touch with the stator. So when this rotor is rotating, so it takes away the gas molecules from the chamber. So when it comes to, so the first step is suction. So it takes the gas molecules from chamber into this gap. The next step is it transfers 
the gas molecules from this region to the exhaust region. So this is the transportation. So when this is happening, so the veins, they close the path from chamber to this region. And then the compression, so the exhaust is closed, right? So because the outside pressure is more than the inside pressure, so the exhaust is closed. So that you'll have the compression. So whenever the pressure inside the, this uh, region, it becomes larger than the atmospheric pressure, then the exhaust opens and the gas molecules they go out. So these the these are the steps involved in creating a rough vacuum using rotary pump. So the maximum vacuum that we can attain is 10 power minus 3 ton. So this is the rough vacuum. So after getting the rough vacuum, then we had to use a diffusion pump or turbo molecular pump. Right? So the diffusion pump, this is a cross section of the diffusion pump. And so it creates a vacuum of 10 power minus 8 ton. This is the maximum vacuum that we can get using diffusion pump. So this is a high vacuum, right? So uh, before operating this diffusion pump, we had to use the rotary pump to create the rough vacuum. Diffusion pump alone, it cannot create the vacuum. So why it cannot create the vacuum? I mean, Tell you. And uh, this diffusion pump, we had to connect in series with the rotary pump. So after getting the vacuum, then we had to switch on the diffusion pump. So when we switch on the diffusion pump, what happens? So the oil that is present here. So this is called the diffusion oil or DP oil or silicon oil. So there will be some heater. So when we switch on the heater, then the oil evaporates. So the oil molecules, they go through this pumping stack. Right, and so they will have some nozzles here. So these, no, so through these nozzles, the oil vapors they come out with high speed. So when they are coming out with high speed, and they are directed in the downward direction, right? So they collide with the gas molecules. So the momentum transfer will happen, and the gas molecules they come to this outlet, and then goes to the rotary pump, right? So. <clears throat> So this, this is how the uh, diffusion pump works. So this way oil vapors, so you'll have water circulation here. Again, these oil vapors, they cool down, condense, and come to the bottom. And the process repeats. Right? So this is called the, uh, uh, this is the working principle of uh, diffusion pump. And a diffusion pump on its own cannot create vacuum because the oil vapors, when they collide with gas molecules, right? So they have to give the energy to the gas molecules. The pressure is very high, right? So the mean free path becomes less. So the energy transfer becomes less. So it cannot create vacuum. So we need a vacuum for uh, <coughs> operation of the diffusion pump. And the pumping speed here it is 100 liter per second to 10 power 5 liter per second. So after creating vacuum, then so we can go to the film deposition. Then, uh, so the, before going to the film deposition, we had to confirm whether it is a rough vacuum or high vacuum. So we need some gauges. So pressure gauges, again, there are different types of pressure gauges. So one is direct gauge and the other one is indirect gauge. So in the uh, vacuum applications, so we use the indirect gauges. So because the pressure is less, direct gauge means force per unit area, it measures. That is the pressure, right? So we define. So that force per unit area, so because the pressure is less, so the force will be less. So the direct gauges, they are not applicable. So we have to go for indirect gauges. So the indirect gauges, so they record the pressure by measuring the gas property. So the gas property it can be thermal conductivity or the ionization current, right? So if it is a thermal conductivity, so what we call it is a Pirani gauge. This measures the rough vacuum and what is the uh, ionization gauge? So that is called the pending gauge. So this measures the high value. So we need a Pirani gauge. So only single gauge won't measure the entire pressure. For measuring rough vacuum, so we need Pirani or thermocouple gauge. And for measuring high vacuum, we need a pending gauge. So the next step is fabrication. So first we have to create the vacuum. And then, so we had to go for uh, deposition. So as I told you, deposition techniques, right? So there are vapor deposition and physical uh, liquid based deposition. 
So the Y is the name vapor phase and liquid phase. So the film, so right, the uh, uh, film formation before the film formation stage, the state of the matter, right? So that is vapor here. And in this case, it is liquid. So vapor to film and liquid to film. So that's why the name vapor phase and liquid phase. So in vapor phase, again, we have physical vapor deposition and chemical vapor deposition. So physical means, so physically we are removing the atoms and molecules by evaporation or sputtering or some other manner. So that's why the name physical vapor and in this case by chemical reaction. So in physical, again, we have different techniques like vacuum evaporation, sputter deposition, also is deposition and molecular beam effects. Okay. And in chemical, so we have atmospheric CVD, low pressure CVD, metal organic CVD, PE CVD, plasma and house CVD. And in liquid based, so we have electrochemical, electrolysis, and spin quarter. Right. So in all these uh, techniques, so the uh, vapor it is converted into the film. And here the liquid is converted into the film. So I am concentrating on this PVD techniques. Right? So vacuum evaporation, sputter deposition, pulse laser deposition, and MBE, molecular beam epitaxy. So the vacuum evaporation, so the name itself tells you so evaporation in vacuum. Right? So the evaporation in vacuum. So there are different techniques again. So thermal evaporation, flash evaporation, arc evaporation, induction heating, and electron beam evaporation. So I am concentrating on thermal and electron beam. So these are the mostly used techniques to prepare the thin films by evaporation, thermal and electron beam. So the uh, in all these techniques, so the main steps involved are first we have to melt the material and then the melt, uh, melted material it has to evaporate. So that is the vaporization of the material. And then these vapors, they have to be transported to the substrate. So the transportation and condensation. So the condensation, so there we'll have the film growth. Film growth, we have to understand how the deflation happens and what are the different growth techniques. Okay? So, so the first one is uh, thermal evaporation. So thermal operation, so this is the chamber. So first we have to create high vacuum using rotary pump and diffusion pump. After creating a high vacuum, so the system is ready for depositing the film. So what it will be there inside this. So inside we have a board, right? And when we pass current through the board, so the board heats up because of resistive heating and then that heat is transferred to the source, so which is the material that we want to deposit. And this is the substrate, right? So the vapors, they go and deposit on the films. So this is a simple technique, right? <clears throat> so here the distance between, it varies based on the system. And so it is a resistive heating technique. Uh, so the heat is transferred from both to the source and the source material, it melts and evaporates. The vapors, they go and stick to the substrates. So we have the film formation. And the deposition rate, right? How fast we are depositing, that is proportional to the mass transfer rate to the substrate, right? So these are the different types of boards that we can use to deposit or to weld the pillars, right? And these board materials, they are uh, made using high refractory uh, metals, right? So high refractory metals. So these refractory metals are tungsten, molybdenum, niobium, and tantalum. So these are the materials are used uh, that are used to make these boards. And they have high resistance and uh, high heat and wear uh, resistance and they have high melting point. So we cannot deposit these materials using thermal evaporation. So we had to use some other technique, right? So these are the materials that we use 
for depositing the films. So these materials, they cannot be deposited using thermal evaporation. So we have to go for some other technique. So that technique is uh, electron beam evaporation. So the disadvantages in this thermal evaporation are they are the contamination because we are using some other material, right? To heat the or uh, to melt the source. So you'll have contamination and difficult to deposit the refractory materials and difficult to control the composition of the alloys and compounds. So if you have alloys and compounds, so different elements in that alloy or compound will have different melting points. So it is difficult to compose, uh, dif uh, difficult to get this composition and uh, difficult to coat thick films. Right? So entire material, it operates and goes in all the directions. So we cannot get the thick films using this technique. So the next operation technique is electron beam operation. So to avoid the contamination and to control the coating thickness, so electron beam is used. So this electron beam, it will have high energy and this energy is transferred to the source material. So we have to take the source in a crucible, right? And then the electron gun, it emits the electrons. So these electrons, they get accelerated and are directed by magnetic fields onto the source. So this high energetic electron beam, when it hits the source, so you have the energy transfer from beam to the source, right? So at that point, melting happens and the material evaporates. Right? So this is the simple technique. So the, to, to, uh, uh, to, to avoid the uh, melting of these crucibles, so we need some water cooling to these crucibles and any material can be operated using this technique. Yeah, substrate we have to keep here. So this is just a uh, crucible and electron pump. So the entire thing will be in a chamber. So on the top, we'll have the substrate. Yeah, same like in thermal evaporation. <clears throat> so we can control the rate of evaporation by controlling the energy of the electron beam. So like this. So we'll have the substrate holder here, and this is the source. So the electron beam it comes and hits the source, and you'll have the evaporation. So this shutter we can open whenever uh, we want to start the deposition. So any metal can be operated and the multiple sources can be used like this. So if you want to deposit multi layers or some other uh, compositions, so we can use multiple elements here and then do the deposition simultaneously. So we'll get uh, multi layers and the uh, alloys are compounds. And the contamination is less because we are not using any board, right? So just we are using a crucible and the crucible we are not heating. So the disadvantage here is difficult to control the composition. So if you use some alloy, right? So that alloy composition, it is very difficult to get uh, in the thin film. Because so the uh, electron beam that is hitting the source, right? It melts only small portion and it breaks the bond between the atoms and molecules. Right, so those atoms and molecules they evaporate and uh, deposit that uh, melting, right? So it won't be uniform. So that's why it is difficult to get the composition. Yes. So the next technique is uh, sputtering. Yeah. So this is the widely used uh, technique to deposit uh, films like alloys bonds etc <clears throat> and you will get uniform films high pure films right and so we'll get good step coverage everything using this sputter deposition technique and we can control the thickness of the film also so sputtering means ejection of atoms so directly without melting so we will eject the atoms from the target so that is the sputtering so the atoms are they are physically removed from the target. So physically they are removed from the target, not by melting, but by some other source. <clears throat> so what happens in sputtering? Yeah. So when the sputtering happens, you have the ejection of neutral atoms, ions, and electrons. 
So all these things will come out from the target and So these neutral atoms, they condense on the so substrate and yeah. so these neutral atoms, they deposit on the substrate and what we get is the film. And the, in the substrate, so the uh, ejection of these neutral atoms, ions and electrons. So that happens because of the positive ion bombardment. So these positive ions, they create these things. So that is why they, this is called cathodic sputtering. If it is a negative thing, then that is anodic sputtering. So, but normally we use cathodic sputtering. And sputtering is a low temperature process. We are not heating. There is no melting of the source material here. So it is a low temperature process. And we need a cooling for the target. Because when the positive ions hit the target, so you will have some heating, right? Because of the heating. So to take away the heat and to avoid the melting, so we need some cooling system. So this is how the sputtering, sputtering happens. So this is the target material. So the target material contains the target atoms. And these target atoms, they are removed by high energetic ions, positive ions. So normally organ is the gas that we use. Why we have to use organ, I'll explain you. And it is a neutral uh, gas, right? So it won't react with the target material. So these organ atoms, so first we have ions here. So we'll get organ plus and these organ ions, they will get high energy and hit the target material. So when the hitting happens, so we'll have the release of the target atoms and the organ ions, it loses its energy. It gets reflected back or it settles in the target. So these sputtered atoms, they go and stick to the substrate. So along with the sputtered atom, we'll have a release of the electrons from the target. So these electrons are called the secondary electrons. And these secondary electrons, again, they get angulated and hit the organ atoms, we have the creation of organ ion and organ ion plus few more secondary electrons. So these electrons, again, they get angulated and hit the organ atoms and creation of organ plus ions. And those organ ions, again, they hit the target. So we have the release of the atoms from the target surface. So this is how the sputtering happens, right? So to Get the filling in sputtering. First, what we have to get is the sustained glow discharge. Right? So that is very important. So the process looks simple. So creating the organ ion and the organ ion goes hits the target, and you have, you have the release of target atoms and uh, secondary electrons. But that process happens only if you have sustained glow discharge. So what is that glow discharge? So it is a discharge. It is some glow. So what is that glow? So that glow you will get if you have a high voltage applied between two electrodes at low pressures, right? Yeah, so this is the, suppose this is the chamber. So you'll have a cathode and anode. And if you apply a voltage between cathode and anode, what happens? So you'll have the current a uh, potential drop between this cathode and anode. So this chamber we had to fill with uh, a gas at low pressures. Then what we get is some discharge. So that discharge will have different bright and dark regions, right? So these different bright and dark regions, they, they are uh, responsible for creating the glow discharge. And in between this cathode and anode, so we have to keep the target material, the source material, right? The material that we want to deposit. Somewhere we have to keep between cathode and anode. So where we have to keep to get this good sputtering yield. So this is the cathode. Normally we keep the target material near the cathode because the organ ions, they move towards the negative electrode, right? They are positive. So when they are moving the negative electrode, so they get accelerated and hit the target material. So we'll have the release of atoms. So near the cathode, but where we have to keep. So if you see that uh, different regions between cathode and anode, so we'll have alternate dark and bright regions. 
So the first region is called the Aston dark space, which is near to the cathode. So it contains low energy electrons and high energy positive ions because this is negative electron, right? So we'll have <coughs> high energy positive ions near to that. After this, what we have is a glow. So that is called the cathode glow. So here we'll have the glow because of the de excitation of the positive ions. After this, again, we'll have a, a dark space. And then, uh, so this contains this acceleration of the electrons and ions. So the acceleration happens here. And most of the voltage drop is of course, uh, in this region. And after this, what we have is the negative glow. So in this negative glow, what we have is fast moving electrons. So the electrons, they move towards the anode. So the acceleration happens in this region. So this is called the negative glow. So after this, again, we'll have this alternate dark, bright, dark, bright regions. So we need up to this point. So because the target material, so it will be closer to the cathode, right? So where we have to keep in these four regions. So in the negative glow, if you see, so we have the fast moving electrons. So these fast moving electrons, when they collide with the argon atoms, so we have the creation of this argon plus ions. So that's why we have to keep the target in the negative glow. So more number of argon ions, they will be created in here. So we have the uh, argon plus ion concentration more. So the sputtering happens or the sputtering yield will be very high if you keep this target material in this region, negative glow. Right? After this, the substrate will be somewhere here. So the substrate is grounded. It, it won't be connected to the anode. Right? So we'll have only the potential difference between cathode and anode. And between the cathode and anode, target is connected to the cathode. Right? Substrate, it is grounded. Okay. Otherwise, what will happen is we'll have the sputtering from the substrate also because of the electrons. <coughs> so this is the voltage distribution between the cathode and anode. So when we uh, so when we apply a small voltage or when we switch on the power supply, what happens? So initially there, there won't be any organ ion. Organ is a neutral gas, right? There, there are no organ plus. So how to create the organ plus ions? So after creating the vacuum, so few electrons will be there inside the chamber. So when we apply a potential difference between cathode and anode, so these electrons, they get accelerated and they hit the organ atom. So we'll have the creation of this argon ions and the secondary electrons. So these argon plus they move towards the cathode and electrons they move towards the anode. So that's why initially we'll have the increase of current and you'll have the breakdown of the gas. The current increases and to deposit the film, so we need, so this is called the downside discharge. There won't be any glow when we switch on the system. So just we'll have the passage of current between the cathode and anode because of this breakdown, right? So, uh, so to deposit the film, what we need a glow discharge. So the glow discharge is between here and here. So the normal glow and abnormal glow. So in the abnormal glow, we'll have the sputter deposition, right? And so the, the difference here is in the normal glow, so the current remains constant and voltage remains constant. and in the abnormal glow, so the current increases and the voltage also increases. The current in this direction, x-axis. This is the IV characteristic of uh, this glow discharge. The sputtering, it happens in this region. So in this, sorry. In the glow discharge region. So this is how the sputtering happens. So we can see the color, blue color, right? So it contains the ions, electrons, Etc. And if you further increase the voltage, what we have is this arc discharge. So if you apply high voltage between two electrodes, right? So we'll get the arc, right? So that is this. Before the arc discharge, what we have is sputtering. <clears throat> so, so to get this sustained glow discharge, so we need this uh, abnormal glow. So these are operation operative domain of the sputtering. And this 
self sustained load discharge again it depends on the breakdown voltage and the uh, product of pressure and distance between the electrodes cathode and anode so what is the separation between these two and what is the pressure inside this chamber so for different uh, elements right so argon neon hydrogen mercury a so if you see the uh, breakdown voltage variation is process with this product p and d so initially it is very high so so our aim is we have to deposit the films at low voltages <clears throat> right so we cannot go very high voltages so very high voltages always danger the recurrence right so we have to deposit the films at low voltages so where we did this low voltages so it depends on this product p and d pressure and the separation between the electrodes so this is the passion law so according to this law so the breakdown voltage it varies like this so if you plot this so initially at low pd values so the breakdown voltage is very high and when you go for high pd values again the breakdown voltage increases at low pd values what happens the electron ion collisions are few right so the pressure is low the collision between the electrons and organ atoms is low so the creation of organ atoms becomes low so that is why uh, the breakdown voltage is very, very high and at high voltages again uh, at high pd values again the pressure is high so the mean trip path becomes less so the energy transfer from electron to the organ it becomes less so the uh, breakdown voltage values will be very high so in between we we'll have minimum value uh, breakdown voltages so we had to use that product of pd so we had to control the pressure based on the distance between the electrodes right so this is uh, so at this point we will get this self sustained load discharge then we can deposit the films another important parameter in sputtering is sputtering yield so sputtering yield means so in thermal operation and electron beam operation so just we are melting the sample and the molten sample evaporates and then deposits the film but uh, in sputtering just we are physically ejecting the atoms so how many atoms are ejected by using a single organ ion right so that is the sputtering yield so the average number of atoms ejected from the target such uh, surface per incident ion right so this yield is very important so if yield is very less then it takes a longer time to deposit the film so sputtering yield is very important so this is the yield variation with uh, per uh, with organ gas for different uh, substrates right so like in photoelectric effect we need some minimum threshold energy for the sputtering to happen so it has to break the bonds right so we need some minimum threshold energy so that threshold energy for these elements for argon gas so it is here 10 to 100 right electron volts and so the sputtering yield it depends not only on the uh, sputtering gas like argon it also depends on it also depends on the energy of the incident ions right and structure and composition of the target so if it is a complex target so the gas it requires more energy to break the bond and the temperature of the target and instant angle of the ions so all these things affects this yield so normal gas that we use uh, for sputtering is argon right so we can go for other higher uh, uh, net gases like xenon radon but they are costly and helium is costly but uh, and it is also lighter gas compared with argon so that's why we go for argon for depositing the films using sputtering and also it depends on the incident angle so if the argon atoms or argon ions when they hit the target normally right so the energy transfer to the surrounding atoms becomes less so sputtering yield decreases so they have to hit the target with some angle right so the angle is also better incident angle is also so if you see the incident angle so if the organ ion hitting to the substrate if it is in this region 60 to 70 then we will have the good yield 
to more number of atoms come out from the surface of the target. So if you see the voltages and currents and the pressures to get this flow discharge, so it will be around one to five flow volts, very high voltage, right? And this is the current in milliamps, and this is the pressure that we require to get this sustained flow discharge. So uh, to decrease this voltages and the pressures, it, if you have high pressure, then you'll have contamination and the growth becomes low. And also we require high voltages. So how we can decrease this high voltage and pressures to some lower values? Then we have to use some other source of electrons. So mainly here to get this sustained flow discharge, secondary electrons are the important ones. So these electrons, they are creating the orthon ions continuously. So we have to use some other source of electrons or so either we have to increase the collision probability of these electrons with the orthon ions. So how to create that? So uh, to get that, what we have is the magnetron sputtering system. So what we have is this diode sputtering system, so DC and RF. So DC sputtering system, so we use for metals and the R we use for <coughs> the non-metals. Because so when we apply the voltage between the anode and cathode, right? If it is a non-metal, then it'll have the polarization. Then the sputtering it won't happen. So to avoid that, so we use this RF sputtering unit. So it operates at this frequency, 13.56 megahertz. And to increase the sputtering yield. So the other system we use are magnetron sputtering system. So now all the sputtering systems are magnetron sputtering systems. It contains some magnetron source. Right? This magnetron source <clears throat> it increases the probability of uh, collision probability of electrons with the argon atoms. So you'll have the more creation of argon plus ions. Right? So how it uh, increases this collision probability? So if you use the ma uh, magnetron system, so the pressure it comes down and the potential also comes down. So previously we had used kilovolts, right? So now if you use a magnetron system, so it is a less than thousand volts, right? And the current uh, pressure required, organ pressure required inside the chamber is also very less, 0 0.2 to 0 0.6 milliton. So uh, if you use a magnetron source, what happens? So we apply the magnetic field Right? So the source contains the magnets, permanent magnets. So these magnets, so this is the North Pole and South Pole. The magnetic field lines, they go from North to the South. And the electrons, right? So they will experience some force because of this applied magnetic field, E cross B. So they move around in the spiral direction, right? So they move near the target in the spiral direction. So the collision probability of electrons with the argon atoms increases. So you'll have the more creation of other plus ions. So the heat increases. So we don't need high voltages and high pressures. So this is the magnetron source. So we'll get the sputtering happens only in this region. Right? If it is a, uh, a non-magnetron source, then you'll have the sputtering in all the regions. But if you use a magnetron source, so you can see the track here, right? So this is called the race track. So sputtering happens only in this region. So this is a uh, magnetron sputtering system. And if you use oxide, oxygen, nitrogen, and some uh, carbon containing elements like uh, uh, compounds like methane, acetylene, propene, et cetera, and uh, sulfides. So it is called the reactive sputtering. So we can get this oxides, nitrides, carbides, sulfides, et cetera. Right. So the advantages here are so you'll get uniform film, and uh, so the addition of the film to the substrate will be good. So we'll get uh, good films, and so the reproducibility of the film will be good because we know what is the amount of pressure inside and what is the voltage that we are applying. So we can keep the same values and get the similar films, and stoichiometry it will be good because it is not melting technique. So just 
we are uh, physically removing the atoms, so we'll get the stoichiometry, and we can control the thickness by controlling the power. The disadvantage here is sputtering rate is low, right? So now that can be overcome. Uh, we can overcome that by using the magnetron sputtering system, and the sputtering targets are expensive. So normally in the lab we use a two-inch diameter target, right? And uh, so we need a target of this size. But for thermal and electron wave operations, so we need small buttons to deposit the films, and we need a target cooling. So these are the disadvantages. So next two techniques are PLD and MBE. I'll finish very quickly. <clears throat> so the pulse laser deposition or PLD pulse laser ablation to the uh, same. So here, uh, like in Electron beam operation. So, in electron beam operation, electron beam is hitting the source and the melting happens. So, here, instead of the electron beam, so the laser hits the source, right? And we'll have the melting of the source. So, ablation, pulse laser ablation means so, so the localized evaporation or removing the atoms and molecules from the at some local point or from the entire material. Compared with the electron beam, here the source uh, is very narrow, right? And it is high energetic. It's a pulse, not the continuous laser, it is a pulse, and any material can be deposited using this PLD. So, the advantage here is the source is outside the chamber. So, the chamber looks very small. So, we can get high vacuum, ultra high vacuum in less amount of time compared with the other operation techniques. And the laser source, it is uh, concentrated onto the target material by using this watch lens. And so this energetic laser beam, when it hits the source, right? So you'll have the uh, melting of the source happens at a time, right? So this energy is very high compared with the electron beam energy. So the, wherever the spot, a uh, laser spot or the laser beam hits the source, so the entire material melts. So that material, it forms a plume like this. So this plume, it contains neutral atoms, ions, electrons, right? some uh, particles, etc. Because the entire uh, melting happens at a time. Right? We have the explosion also. Like, like It is like explosion. So it contains all the uh, components, like electrons, ions, atoms, molecules, and some particles, etc. And it forms a plume, and this plume directed perpendicular to the target and goes to the substrate. We'll have the deposition of the substrate of the, the deposition of the film on the substrate. Right? So the target to substrate distance is around 2 to 10 centimeters. So uh, this is how the plume looks. So the normally used uh, laser sources they are solid state NDR lasers. And this is the wavelength, and this is the energy, two joules, very high, right? And this is the pulse rate, nutrition rate. And some other sources are gas examiner lasers like organ fluoride, krypton fluoride, xenon fluoride, etc. And these are the energies, and these are the wavelengths. So this is briefly about uh, PLD. So the advantages here is. Source is outside, and so because of the high energy, entire material it evaporates, so we'll get the good composition. And so the reactive gases can also be used to get oxides, nitrates, etc. And any material can be deposited. So the PLD it became popular after depositing the superconducting YBCO film. Right? So YBCO normally people observed superconducting nature only at, in the bulk form. So PLD. Is a technique that is used to deposit the superconducting YBCO films. After that, it became very popular. And the disadvantage is, or it is very expensive, and so we need a small button, right, uh, of the material to deposit. So, so, uh, so the uh, evaporation happens only in a small region. The plume it is directed onto the substrate. The plume is very narrow, so the deposition area is very less here. And you'll have the splashing of the microscopic particles. 
because energy is very high, right? So you'll have explosion happens. So you'll have some splashing of this microscopic particles onto the substrate. So these are the disadvantages. And the last technique is uh, in the physical evaporation is molecular beam epitaxy. So MBE is more and molecular beam epitaxy. <clears throat> so this is the costliest technique and it takes a longer time to deposit films using this technique. So the advantage here is, so we can deposit uh, monolayers. Monolayers means atomic layer thick films, one atomic layer, two atomic layers. So like this films, we can deposit using this molecular beam attacks. So to deposit the films using molecular beam taxi, first we need to create ultra high vacuum, right? So high vacuum is enough for sputtering PLD and uh, other deposition techniques, but for uh, getting this molecular beam epitaxy, modal layers, right? So we need to create ultra high vacuum, very high vacuum. So that creating high vacuum takes time. So sometimes we need to bake the chamber and then evacuate the chamber for two days and then deposit the film. So it is a long process. So uh, other thing is here, we'll get the epitaxial films, single crystal films. So in all the other techniques, we want to get our polycrystal films, or amorphous films. So in molecular epitaxy, we'll get single crystalline films. So epitaxy means growth of single crystal films. That's why the name molecular beam epitaxy. And there are two types of epitaxy, homo epitaxy and hetero epitaxy. So homo epitaxy means if the lattice parameters are matching, right? So we'll get the same film onto the substrate. So that is homo epitaxy. If the lattice parameters are, if there is a mismatch, but still we can get some crystalline films, single crystal films. So that is hetero epitaxy. Suppose uh, if you are depositing, if you want to deposit aluminum arsenide and gallium arsenide, right? So the lattice parameters are different for aluminum arsenide and gallium arsenide. So they will have some mismatch between the substrate and film. So that creates, creates some strains. So these strains, Again, they aid to get this uh, crystalline films on the substrate. So this is heteroepitaxy. So as I told you, so we need ultra high vacuum. So in the ultra high vacuum, the mean three path. So the molecular beam directly goes to the substrate material and we have the deposition of the film. So if you see the mean three path versus pressure, so at low pressures, so the mean three path will be very high. 10 power 8 centimeters, right? So at this pressure, 10 power minus 10 tau. So the molecular beam directly goes and hits the substrate. So we'll get the film. And so we can control the evaporation, right? So this is the chamber. So we have different sources. So these sources, they are called the uh, efficient cells or Lutzen cells. So they are, uh, uh, they work based on like uh, thermal evaporation or electron beam operation. So we'll have a heating element here and that heating element melts the source and the vapors, they come out from these cells. So that uh, coming out from these cells, that is controlled, right? So we'll have a small opening here. So the vapors, they come out and forms the film of the substrate. That is controlled so, so that, uh, so, one, um, so, so the amount of, suppose some amount of vapor that comes out from the source and deposits a film on the substrate, right? So the next amount of vapor that comes out from the source, it takes time. By the time, so the uh, deposited atoms on the substrate, they sit in, right? So, and then next uh, amount of vapor that comes. So like this, so the deposition rate or the uh, settling rate is more than the deposition day. Settling amount of time is more than the deposition time. So that's why it takes a longer time to deposit the films using this molecular wave of taxi, but it gives uh, pure films, crystalline films, and the monolayer films. So the one advantage here is, uh, so since it is taking longer time, right? So we need some in-situ characterization techniques like read them, so which measures what is the thickness of the film and some other uh, mass spectrometer, et cetera, to know what are the elements and uh, what is the composition of the film, et cetera.
right? So the uh, read gun it uh, gives the thickness of the film, so like this. So it is the intensity versus time. So without any deposition or the, during the deposition is happening, so the intensity increases like this. And when the one atomic layer is formed, so it gives the signal like this. So this signal it indicates one atomic layer. So if you have two signals like this, two atomic layers. Like this. So this is called reflection high energy electron diffraction. So this MBE techniques will have some in situ characterizations. And these are the efficient cells, <clears throat> right? So that are used in uh, molecular memory taxi. And the last two technique is, as I told you, so the thickness measurement. So yeah, these are the advantages and disadvantages. So disadvantages, long time process, expensive, and we need sensitive efficient cells to avoid contamination, etc., and the need ultra high vacuum. Advantages, okay, so we can get single crystal pure films, etc., and we can get monolayer films, and it is mainly used in semiconductor industry. So thickness measurement, thickness again, it is an important property because the important thing in the films, so because the properties they change with the thickness. So uh, one thing is here, if you see, it, it is a 10 nanometer film and 60 nanometer films. The magnetic moment variation, it is different for both. Right, so thickness is an important property. So thickness, we can in situ, we can measure what is the thickness of the film during the deposition. So uh, in the case of molecular beam abduction, it is a read gun. In the other techniques, it is a uh, distal thickness monitor. So the distal thickness monitor, it contains a quartz crystal like this. So this quartz crystal, it will have some frequency. So right, uh, depending on the thickness of the crystal. So for uh, 0.3 mm crystal, the resonance frequency is 5 megahertz. So during the deposition, so we'll have the deposition of the crystal also. So as the thickness changes, so the resonance frequency changes. So by measuring the resonance frequency, we'll know what is the thickness of the film. And it is directly proportional to, sorry, inversely proportional to the thickness of the crystal. Right? So as the thickness increases, so this resonance frequency decreases. So this is the in situ technique uh, is used in all the sputtering systems, electron wave operations, and the thermal wave operations, etc. Here is only MBE we have the read gun. In other techniques, so this is the system. So this is briefly about uh, deposition of films and the thickness measurement, right? So if you have any questions. Thank you. So, you know, anybody has a question, please. Students, please. Please, sir. Uh. Yeah, so. 3D confinement means so all the dimensions are reduced to the nano level. So if you want to understand uh, how the energy level distribution is, so 3D confinement it is analogous to the quantum mechanical problem of particle in a 3D box, right? So particle in a 3D box, if you see the energy levels, so they are discrete, like uh, delta functions. So they have lines. So continuous means so uh, continuous it is a parabolic distribution. So instead of parabolic distribution, we'll have the lines. So that is the discreteness. We don't talk about the connection and the energy of the power. Yeah, discrete energy levels. So only in the uh, bulk materials, what we have is this class. They are discrete. If somebody is talking about the nanoscale, somebody said that the food is chicken of energy also. Also, for the quantum confinement, there is no balance. Ah, no. These energy levels they shift. So they are discrete, but they can shift. And the other points are that the basic question. Well, discharge phenomenon. Discharge phenomenon. So you are saying the point of view, the point of view that is. 
Yeah, here what is happening is uh, when we apply the voltage, the electrons they get accelerated. So these accelerated electrons they hit the argon atoms and will have the creation of argon ions. Right? So these argon ions again they hit the uh, target material and will have the release of atoms, ions, electrons, etc. Secondary electrons. So these uh, ions, right, when they go from excited state to the ground state, they emit some energy. So what we see is the positive growth. In the same way, if you have uh, more energetic electrons in some region, so what we call it as a negative growth. This is a positive growth and negative growth. The origin source from the emission of electrons from the no. There is no emission of electrons. Uh, yeah. To get the sustained flow discharge, we need the secondary electrons. The starting is the electrons that are present inside the chamber. Few electrons will be there. So when you apply the voltage, these electrons they get activated. Initially, there are no organ atoms, as organ ions, and no secondary electrons. So the electrons that are so few gas molecules will be there inside, right? It is not completely vacuum. So 10 power minus 8 tor or 10 power minus 10 tor. So you'll have few gas molecules and few electrons. So those electrons are the starting points. They get accelerated and create the ions. Well, these are the electrons and what are the ions? They become collected and you have the negative glow. Ah, so these electrons they give this negative glow, and the ions when they come from higher uh, excited state to the ground state, they emit some energy. So, uh, like so, right? That gives a uh, positive glow. Please. Oh. Oh, sure. Good morning, sir. Um, so, while uh, talking about uh, telephone being the operation, um, we accelerate the electrons and um, we made them different by using some magnetic field. Sorry. So, um, when we accelerate these electrons, the energy of these electrons will be ability constant or ability value? We can vary. We can control the uh, potential difference, right? So, the voltage that we are applying. So, we can control the energy of the electron. And also, not only energy of the electron, we can control the uh, direction of these electrons. So, where the electron spot, it has to fall on the source. Because every uh, different material uh, has a different momentum velocity. Correct, yeah. So we can control we can... the energy of the electrons okay. so, by uh, varying the pressure. Uh, in the DC values, I uh, have been uh, studying uh, this electron portion, but uh, most of the materials uh, which produce, uh, most of the things which produce by these, uh, this mechanism uh, requires a uh, high momentum velocity. Uh, like, uh, how, how, uh, like, is it not possible uh, for the materials which have a low medium points? Can we not uh, for these electron moving Like, uh, for example, in the high part of uh, uh, preparing a cobalt oxide thing, mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, like, when I uh, talk to one of the uh, technician to this is a university, he said, um, um, the temperature should be high. But, um, when it comes to my material, uh, it has 895 degrees Celsius. Uh, um, before the performing electron operation, we have to make a pellet and we have to sinter it, right? Actually, cobalt oxide, right? Yeah. So you can directly get the cobalt oxide uh, pellets. Cobalt is a hard material, first of all. Right? Uh, these, these hard materials, so we can get in the form of buttons or pellets or cylinders, small form pieces. So yes. those pieces we can use in a crucible and uh, we can control the uh, energy of the electron beam and deposit. So we can deposit cobalt oxide. It's not a problem. We use cobalt oxide, but we So those, those pellets also you can use in the crucible to deposit the films. Only thing is you won't get the cobalt oxide composition. One material composition. That is the only disadvantage. 
So if you want uh, cobalt oxide, then you have to use some reactive gases like oxygen. So during the deposition, and this oxygen, or after the deposition, you have to pass oxygen through the film and do the heat treatment. So this will be the direct cobalt oxide. So we need to the composition it varies. Suppose if you want CO2, uh, CO2, cobalt oxide, dioxide, right? CO2. CO2. Ah, CO2. CO2. Yeah, then O4 you won't get. O4 exact like uh, force stoichiometry that you may not get if you use the uh, uh, electron level operation. So if you use the RF sputtering, then you will get that composition. So in all the systems, there is a limitation in the size of the film that we get. Right, dimension of substrate, uh, uh, sub substrate dimension normally Hmm. Yeah, other there will be a limitation. It depends on the uh, distance between the substrate to the source and the pressure inside and the rate of deposition. Another thing is how you ensure that the uniformity of the thickness. Thickness in thermal operation, uniformity will be very less. Because the evaporated vapors it go in all the directions, so the uniformity becomes very less. But in sputtering, you will get uniform thick films if the uh, uh, substrate size is maximum. We can go around twice the size of the target. And we need substrate rotation also to get the uniform. So normally, small small area. Uh, in thermal operation, if you use a substrate rotator, you get the uniform flux. For so larger area, it is different. Size, how you can relate between the uniformity and the size and the relation. Uh, the thermal lab operation, so the uniformity depends on the distance between the substrate and source. Yeah, that, is uh, that is one. And how fast you are on the rate of deposition. So if you deposit very fast, then the uniformity becomes less and you will get rough flux. We need smooth films, so we had to control that rate of deposition. That is difficult in thermal operation. So if you use electron beam operation, we can, can get the Electron beam operation is excellent. So you, you have this facility that you know the lab. So in my lab, I have DC sputtering unit, DC magnetron sputtering system, single target. So in that, you can get uh, We can deposit metallic films. So you'll get uniform films uh, around in five centimeter, uh, five by five. Yes, it makes the biomaterial uh, this is more. Is this no, no, biomaterial we can do. Oh, biomaterial and the biomaterial. On the biomaterial we can do. Yeah, yeah, that we can do. Yeah. So in, if you want to deposit metals, uh, we use this is sputtering system that I have in the lab. And the size is around uh, two inch diameter. Yeah, so we can hold the biomaterial in the substrate region and then deposit. Thank you, sir, for your informative speech and thank you for making up the films. So let me thank the speaker and uh, uh, let I just want to summarize what we learned from the uh, talk. And thin films are of thickness ranging from few angstrom units to micrometer, and the uh, translation symmetry is broken in one direction. So we can call them as one day uh, one D confinement materials. And then, um, so preparation of these materials. Um, uh, is uh, depends on the substrate material, temperature, pressure, and the rate of deposition, and the various uh, vacuum creation techniques uh, are understood, and also pressure gauge uh, is important here, and also deposition techniques, various deposition te deposition techniques are explained well. So uh, with this brief summary, I thank the speaker for giving for giving an informative talk on uh, thin film and thin films and making of thin films. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.
Come on, Sanjay. Thank you to the organizers. Thanks for the chair, Suresh Garu, and then Kevil Garu, Prasad Garu. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think we are going to invite our students. So these sessions are recorded. Uh, how many of you understood the importance of this session? But uh, from my experience, I understood that this entire thing, whatever sir said, is actually a very big force. So as, as we explained from the top to bottom, okay, when we are doing our PhD, we have to down to these forces, thinking technology is very, very important. The devices that we are enjoying today is based on different technology, how you are growing the metals and oxides, metal oxides, etc., on the substrates. So that has given the fundamental principles how to grow the films, which is useful for the students, scholars, and who are uh, starting their career in the device applications. It's very, very important. Thank you, sir, for coming over here. Thank you. Thank you once again. Now I request uh, uh, this email, sir, to
Welcome back, students. Welcome back to the session. Let me introduce uh, Envish Suresh Kumar, sir. Sir has completed his MSc physics from Acharya Nagarjuna University, Kundu, and he also completed MTech in biotechnology from JNTU, Hyderabad, and completed his PhD in computational natural sciences from IIIT, Hyderabad. He has 15 years of experience. He worked as a SRF for five years and senior research scientist for two and a half years at CCNSB, IIIT, Hyderabad. Till the date, he has published 15 research articles in various Scopus index, index international journals. He is currently working as assistant professor of physics in the, in the Department of Humanities and Sciences, Vienna Vignana Jyoti, Engineering and Technology, Hyderabad. His research interests are DFT based modeling of the reaction pathways of biomolecular react reactions and SERS spectra of molecules tagged to a metal and semiconducting nanoclusters for molecular level sensing applications. With this brief introduction about sir, I request Suresh sir to deliver his lecture. Thank you, sir. Nice introduction. The students, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, Mike is working. Yes, Mike is not working. Now, I think it is working, right? OK, so, so this is um, a computational studies. So you can use some computer programs to understand the properties of um, molecules or materials. So, so this is the outline of my presentation here. So it is, um, I start with some computational studies, how uh, we actually, the theory behind that, we, I just explained that first. And then density functional theory is used for computation for most of the materials and molecules. And there is a pro, um, software Gaussian, we can use it for running the DFT calculations. And later, we I just show the nano clusters and sensing surface enhanced Raman scattering is a sensing technique. And the final thing is summary. Okay. So here, so there are three things here. You need to understand what these three first and theory. Modeling and computation, all the three are related here. And theory is some rules governing the behavior of physical systems, and they involve some mathematics. So you you learn so many theories, right? Um, in physics, can you name some theories? So I think you learned band theory of solids. Right? Band theory of solids is used to understand why some materials are acting as metals, why some are acting as semiconductors, and then insulators. So it is set up some rules and equations are there. And we solve some differential equations to get the solutions. Right? So theory is set up some rules and equations and all that. But there are some uh, equations which you can't solve exactly. So exact solutions you don't find. So at that time, we go for the approximations. OK, so approximation to the exact theory is a model. OK, so you can use that model and you can solve the equation because you approximated some of the aspects, so modal equations can be solved. So, and then 
using such model you can write some computer programs algorithms so you can run those that code on the system computers and then you can get the solutions using those solutions you can explain the properties of the molecular systems it may be a molecular system it may be a nano system nano material right so so far we have been listening to the experimental methods of synthesizing nano materials and characterization of the nano materials there are experimental tool techniques but without going to the experimental techniques first you can do all these calculations on the systems and using your computer programs so and then you can predict the properties and you can suggest you can suggest some new materials to the to an experimentalist because this is how i ran the calculations and this is a model material i ran the calculations and these are the properties observed if you can able to synthesize such material you will get the you, will, you can you can de develop a new material so before you go to the wet lab before you synthesize any new material first you run the simulations using some uh, sub, uh, appropriate theory and all that then whatever result you get so they will be validated by the experimentalists so you can save some time of the experimentalist right if you experimentalist also can save some chemicals so suppose without having any in input so he may be synthesizing something maybe or uh, finally he may not get the desired product so it, it is wastage of time and and chemicals also so that is beforehand he is having if he is having some input then that is good for an experimentalist so the, this the idea of doing computation is all that to help an experimentalist okay so now how we run the how we run the model calculations and all that how we do the computation so we see all that now Yeah. So here, so there are three branches here. One is quantum mechanics, molecular mechanics, and classical mechanics. So time and length scale. Depending upon the time scale and length scale, you can decide which theory is appropriate for your system. Okay. If the size of the system is above millimeter or in the millimeter range, if the time scale of motion is in seconds. Then you can apply classical mechanics. That is your Newton laws of motion, right? If the size is in uh, in around nanometer, less than nanometer, because we are all talking about nano materials. So if the size is in the range of nano, in its time scale of motion is femtosecond, then you can't apply classical mechanics. Okay, you know the reason for that. So wave properties come into the picture. So then you have to use quantum mechanics. So in between quantum mechanics and classical mechanics, you have molecules and molecular motion. And there are four speed equations for that based on the Hooke's law. So you can write, you can use those four speeds and you can calculate the energies. That is bond energy, bond angle energy, torsional energy, and all that. So you there are mathematical equations. You can write code for that. You can run the calculations for a given system you will get the, you can get the energy so the point is that so what type of what what is the size of the system what is the time scale of motion of the system taken based on that we will go for an appropriate theory right so if you are in nano range we use x i equal to e i that is schrodinger equation so now to implement any theory so to implement any computation on any system so first thing is that you observe the experimental experimental findings okay so you can give theoretical justification to that okay so for any experimental finding you can give theoretical justification by running the calculations so 
So, for example, you know, photoelectric effect, the theoretical justification was given by Einstein. So, an experimental observation was given theoretical justification. There is a value for that. So, here also, what we do is that first you observe any, you take an input from an experimentalist and you run the simulations. So, before you run the simulations, you make you make some assumptions, some approximations, right? So the real systems can be modeled. So you can go for some prototype systems. Then you choose some mathematical formulation which you can apply on that. Then you get the solutions by solving those equations. Then interpret the solutions. If there is a validation for the solution, okay. Otherwise, you just go back to your assumption and correct the assumption. Then again, go for the cycle. You can run this until you get a valid result. Okay. So this is how you can actually implement modeling of systems using computer programs. Okay. Then this is the master equation, Schrodinger equation. We apply as long as the motion of the system, that is motion of the particles is non-relativistic. That means the speed is negligible compared to the speed of light, right? If it is comparable to the speed of light, then we use Dirac equation. So the limitation for using this equation is that we are using momentum and energy relation is E equal to P square by 2M. As long as that equation is satisfied for that system, you can use this Schrodinger equation. So for many systems, you can use this Schrodinger equation and you can get the solution and you can interpret the results, experimental findings. So now the same equation you can express as H psi equal to E psi. So this is the exp expansion of the Hamiltonian operator. So this is kinetic energy of the particles, right? This is your total energy minus so this is total energy minus potential energy right so this is what you know this equation schrodinger equation you already derived this one you know this this is laplacian of the wave function and this is total energy this is potential energy now here see this one this is the kinetic energy operator potential energy operator sum of these two is the total energy so this equation is just rearranged in this way Okay, so h is minus h cross square by 2m del square is the kinetic energy operator. So any property you want to measure corresponding to that property, you have to write an operator and incorporate that operator in the equation, then you get the property related to that. So then this equation you can solve for few problems. So this is this is a particle in box problem. You have studied this one, and this is rigid rotor. So this is, from this one, you can estimate the rotational energy levels of a system. So particle in box problem gives you the translation energy of microscopic particles. That is quantum mechanical treatment of the particle moving in a box. So how energy is quantized and all that you can explain here. So this is for the rotational energy levels. And this is the quantum mechanical treatment of simple harmonic motion, vibrational energy levels, you can find exactly for us for, for any object that is moving. The quantum mechanical treatment of the vibrational motion. And this is this is of the hydrogen atom. You can exactly solve that. So these are the few problems which can be solved exactly with no approximation. Quantum mechanical treatment you can apply, you can get exact solutions of that. So you can explain the energy levels and wave functions all. But many of the systems that they can't be the Schrodinger equation of those systems can't be solved. The reason is that, for example, you take any many electron system. That is any system consisting of elements helium, neon, so helium. You know all the elements in the periodic table except hydrogen. So any other element is many electron system, more than one electron. So if you want to apply quantum mechanics and then that is solving the Schrodinger equation for such systems, you can't, you can't solve exactly. 
So that is the idea. For example, water molecule, you want to find energy of the electronic energy levels of the water molecule. So water is also a many electron system consisting of 10 electrons. So you can write Schrodinger equation for water molecule and you can get the solution, but it is not, you, you can't solve the equation of uh, Schrodinger equation of water molecule exactly. I will tell you the reason why you can't solve that. So this is, so we always go for the approximate solutions for, for many electron systems. So approximate solutions also give some reasonable results. It is not that you can't violate completely. See, for example, this is particle in box problem. You all know how this can be solved exactly. You studied in engineering physics. So, so see, this is the true solution. So this is true solution. We all know this. But there are some approximate solutions also. You can see, you can take this as an approximate solution, x into L minus x. So this will also obey the boundary equations. Whenever you put x equal to 0, wave function becomes 0. Whenever x equal to L, wave function is 0. So if this is also an approx, this is also this also you can take as a solution to the particle confined in a box. And taking this as a solution, you can find the energy. So this is for finding the energy, this is the equation here. So this is the expectation value. This is your wave function, whatever you have taken as an approximate solution. This is Hamiltonian operator. And then, so this is the numerator and this is the, the denominator is the overlap integral. Numerator is, uh, numerator is interaction energy. So whatever you, energy you get here, taking this as the approximate solution, that energy will always be greater than true energy of the system. Because true energy is related to the true solution. So since you have taken approximate solution, you will get some value, but that is always greater than the true energy. But how much, so how uh, that is, what is the difference between the true energy and approximate energy you are getting? That is minimal. You can see that one here. So whatever the solution you are getting using this one is for lowest energy, n equal to 1. It is 0 0.126615 h square by ml square. So true energy is 0 0.125. This is h square by 8 ml square is the true energy, lowest energy. Now, what is the error in energy estimation? 1.32 only. That is okay. So you have taken approximate solution, you are getting some value energy. That is just error is 1.32 only. So similar to that, you can take some. So suppose this ground state energy is obtained only with this one. So if you want to get so next to energies of the next to four energy levels above ground energy. So you can take the wave functions like this f1 equal to x into l minus x. This is the one. And you can take another function x square into l minus x whole square f3, f4. You incorporate them in the linear combination like this. So this is the total solution now, approximate solution. Take this as the solution and put it here. Then you can estimate first to four energies of the particle in box. So this is another way of finding approximate solutions to a problem here. So approximate solutions also valid. So you can't rule out completely. Now, so why we are doing all that? Just even you take a nano cluster or nano material. You implement the same thing on the nanomaterial, you will get some approximate solutions. So solution is wave function. So wave function gives you the most probable positions where electrons are observed. And you can also estimate the energies. Based on that energies and wave functions, you can tell the stability of the nanomaterial or nano cluster. So that is, and you can also study some properties. I will tell you what properties you can study. At the end of this, you can understand how these uh, calculations are valuable uh, to give some uh, input to an experimentalist. So here, quantum theory of computation, here the problem of solving the Schrodinger equation here is, so this is the Hamiltonian for many electron system. That is system having more than one electron. 
So what are the what are the terms here? Hamiltonian. This is kinetic energy of all the electrons. So this is kinetic energy of the nuclei, and this is electron nucleus interaction, and this is electron electron interaction, and this is nucleus 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 interaction between the nuclei. So what is so here? So there is an approximation here. So you you want to simplify the Hamiltonian first. I said that I'm using. I'm going for the approximate solutions. So how I simplify this? I assume that nuclei are at rest compared to the velocity of electrons because electrons are light, lighter particles. They can move at high speed. Nuclei are heavy compared to the velocity of electrons. Well, velocity of nuclei is almost zero. So since you are finding the electronic energy levels and all that, you are looking at only electronic. Gas, so and at the energy energy levels, when you are moving with velocity of electrons, you feel that nuclei are almost at rest. So what do I do here? Here, I can assume that this is zero. Okay, for a given configuration, kinetic energy of nuclei is zero, and interaction between two nuclei is constant because nuclei are at rest. So this is constant term. So I can eliminate these two. But for right, and I can simplify the Hamiltonian in this way. So this is simplified version. Only I have three terms in the Hamiltonian. So I will put this Hamiltonian here, and I will find the energy. So I have only three operators here. So I can simplify this. So this is Born-Oppenheimer approximation. So then, so how? Why? What is the difficulty in solving? Still, there is a difficulty here. Even I reduce to two terms in the Hamiltonian, still there is a difficulty. What is the difficulty? So many electrons. See, so electrons are. I just go. Yeah. So even I have three terms in the Hamiltonian. This is kinetic energy of electrons, electron nucleus interaction, and then electron electron repulsion here. So electron electron repulsion is a problematic term here because electrons are poly, electron motion is correlated motion here. So correlated means position of one electron is governed by position of another electron because there exist Coulomb forces of repulsion and exchange interactions will be there. So po positions of electrons are not independent; their motion is dependent. So Nowadays we are also in a competitive world, so your position is also decided by your performance in the competitive exam. So we are all in the correlated world, just like that. Electrons motion is also correlated motion; they are not, it is not independent. So electrons, so with the that variables describing the electron motion are insuperable. Variables describing the electron motion are insuperable because their motion is dependent. So because of this, this is the problem. You can't separate the variables describing the position motion of the electrons. So, what are the variables describing the motion of electron? You see this one. For example, electrons are there. Electrons are in the inner atom. You can assume that if they are obeying spherical symmetry. For describe for describing the motion of electron, you can use spherical polar coordinates. So that is for for example, if the if if an atom is here, suppose if an electron is here. Its its position is decided by this vector r and this polar angle and this azimuthal angle. So, for a position of an electron is decided by three variables r, theta, and phi. Suppose if one electron is there, I I need three coordinates to specify the position of electron r, theta, and phi. If a second electron is there somewhere, then it is having different values for r, theta, phi. So six coordinates are required to specify two electrons, but these six coordinates are not independent because there is a there is Coulomb force of repulsion between them. So r r one theta one phi one say for they are the coordinates for first electron. R two theta two phi two coordinates for the second electron. You can't treat them as independent variables. So if they are independent variables. For example, if r theta phi total wave function is function of r and theta and r theta phi only. For example, one electron here wave function of one electron is function of r theta phi. 
So if they are separable, coordinates are separable, then I can write this equation as product of three independent functions. Each one is function of one parameter, r of r, theta of theta, and phi of phi. So now I can write this, I can use this and I apply variable separable method. So I can solve the equation exactly. But since these variables are not independent, I can't write in this way for many electron system. So I can't solve the equation exactly because of non-separability of the variables describing the motion of electrons. So then I will just definitely go for the I will definitely go for the approximate methods. Now this is a this is the picture showing electron electron Coulomb repulsion and exchange interactions. Okay, so because of this only their motion is correlated motion. So next is electrons must obey Pauli exclusion principle to make sure that they obey Pauli exclusion principle. I use this Slater type determinant. That means I express the total wave function in terms of one electron orbitals, kept keeping them in the determinant form. So for any many electron system, you write the wave equation, wave function in this way. If you write the wave function for many electron system in this way, they, they obey Pauli exclusion principle in the distribution of in their distribution in any molecular system. So every, every element in the matrix is one electron orbital. So if you want to get total wave function, you, need, you must know each and every element of this matrix. So how do I get every element of this matrix? So there are very there are there are methods here. This is Hartree Fock approximation. So for every element, I will write an equation like Schrodinger equation. I will solve this one. I will solve this one for every individual electron. I solve Schrodinger equation. So in Hartree Fock approximation, this is the most important term, Hartree Fock potential. So what I do is that electron electron motions again approximated in such a way that every electron feels some average charge because of electrons around it so this is hartree fock potential so the approximation is that i am not taking one to one interaction between the electrons i am taking one electron i am assuming that it is surrounded by some average charge and experiencing repulsion because of this average charge so I am averaging the electron electron interaction in terms of Hartree Fock potential. So, this is again approximation here. So, putting the, the, the expansion of this one is this one Coulomb interaction, exchange interaction. So, I will use this and I will solve this for every individual orbital. After getting, I will put that in the Slater determinant. I will write the total wave function. Right. So, by writing the individual atomic orbitals, I will express them in terms of the in terms of linear combination of the known orbitals so linear combination of known orbitals are these are the gaussian type functions so these are well known functions these are hydrogen like wave orbit, uh, hydrogen uh, wave functions of the hydrogen 1s wave function 2s wave function these are exactly known so these are known and i will just take link I will put that in the one electron uh, Schrodinger equation. I will solve that. This is a self consistent field method which is used iteratively to get the best wave function. To get the to get best wave function means so best best phi orbitals. So in this one, I said that size are these these chi i's are already known. What is unknown? Coefficients are unknown. So I'm using the self-consistent field method to find these co coefficients. Okay. Right. So this is this is another one DFT density functional theory here. So here what we do is that every all properties can be obtained from a density. So ground state probability density, and this ground state probability density can be obtained from external potential this is external potential and number of electrons external potential means that is the force electrons this this term that is force experienced by electrons with, from the nuclei 
So this I, I, I treat this as external potential and total number of electrons. So these two are determined from the density. So density, so if I, so using the density, I will find these two. Using these external potential and total number of electrons, I will find the electronic wave function and ground state energy. This is the scheme. Only the thing is that you must know the electron density of the system. If you know, you can find external potential that is force experienced by the nuclei, so force experienced by the electron from the nuclei, and total number of electrons you can determine. Once you know these two, you can get ground state energy and electronic wave function. That's it. So, how you find this density? That is all Ponsham method. So, this is all Ponsham method is available. So, I can discuss that if anybody is interested. You can approach me GGA, beta GGA, and hybrid functionals. And then using that is free software, you can install that in systems in, in which. MS, Gaussian, and all that. So you can input file format. Every software has its own. own input file format. So you can automatically generate that input file format from I am asking for, and this is how I am modeling the orbitals. And I am asking for optimization, energy minimization, and frequency calculations, and Raman activity I want. And geometry is Cartesian, Cartesian coordinates are specified here. And zero is the charge, one is the multiplicity of the system. Okay, so for this one, this is the input file format. And then after running that, you will get, you can see the output file like this. And these are all the input output commands. Whatever the calculations you ask for, for all the things, they are expressed in this way input output command format. So this is this is the these are the calculations you ask for. And after running the simulations, so if the optimization is completed, you can see this 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 kind of information. So this is converged, yes, converged for force, maximum force, converged for RMS force, converged for converged for maximum displacement, RMS displacement. So if all these are appearing in this way, then you can say that it, you, are, you, you determine the minimum energy structure of the molecule. Then these are the charges located on every individual atom. So then you can see some important parameters. Yeah, this, this is, these are the frequencies that is normal modes with what frequency they are all, every individual uh, atom is vibrating or bonds are vibrating. And these are the, uh, this is IR activity, IR intensity, Raman activity values. And these are the normal modes, okay? For this mode of vibration, how each and every atom is displacing from equilibrium position, these are called as normal modes. So you will get this information here. And then, yeah, this this is these are the energy. This is energy data. I said that zero point collected electronic energies. This one. This is uh, thermal. This is Gibbs free energy. This is enthalpy. This is thermal energy of the system. So these this these numbers we use for analyzing the energy of the material, energy of the system, whatever you are uh, simulating or modeling. Then uh, what are the properties you get? You can you can explore potential energy surfaces 
and energy of the structures, transition states, reaction pathways, and then molecular orbitals, multipole moments, then frequencies of vibrational mode, IR, uh, vibrational modes, IR intensity, Raman spectra, NMR properties, polarizabilities, and then all these solvent effects also you can study. So then after that, say this is now nano cluster. So yeah, and here I am talking about nano clusters. So cluster means size is around two, two nanometer, and nano particle is, uh, if you can say our definition is one nanometer to hundred nanometer are nano particles. But when the size is around two nanometer, we call that as nano cluster. And this is how uh, uh, energy, electronic energy levels will change, growing from going from atomic state to the cluster state and then to the nanoparticle state. So you can see how energy separation is decreasing, going from atomic state to the cluster state. So uh, my interest is here, nano cluster here. So then I am talking about surface enhanced Raman scattering here because this is a sensing technique. So nanomaterials can be are having sensing applications. Just earlier also he said that thin films are acting as sensors. But sensing you can study using surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy, that is vibrational spectroscopic technique. So the point is that what he says, you all know that Raman effect is just uh, when light is falling on any molecular system. So the frequency of the light is changed. That is, it may be, suppose if incoming light is with new frequency, new, you can see uh, scattered light with frequencies. Uh, nu plus d nu or nu minus d nu. So, strokes and anti stroke lines you can see, and this is the explanation for that one. So, when but this, whatever the scattered light, if its intensity can be amplified if molecule is stacked to any nano material. So, this is called surface enhanced Raman scattering. So, molecules when they are stacked to any nano materials or nano clusters, their intensity will be increased. So order of increase, it is around 10 power 8 times. Also, you can increase the intensity of the scattered light. So if nano material is not there, you will get low intense scattered light. When metal atom is stacked to the, so any molecule is stacked to nano cluster, intensity of the Raman scattered light increases. So with that enhanced light, you can actually characterize the structures of the molecule and all that. So this is surface enhanced Raman scattering. And now see this one. This surface enhanced Raman scattering can be understood with in two mechanisms, electromagnetic enhancement and chemical enhancement. And electromagnetic enhancement, so it is collective excitation of the electron cloud when light falls on the material. So that this is the this is the nanomaterial metal or semiconducting nanomaterial having so much of electric, uh, so many free electrons, when light falls on the system, then these electrons will excite. Since this molecule is stacked to this one, so since by using that enhanced light, you can study the structure of this molecule. And chemical effects are also there. So chemical effects comes from absor absorption of the molecule on this one, charge transfer between metal and the molecule, so this is this is something where you can actually study how uh, molecules can be traced when they are tra when they are tagged to the metal or semiconducting nano clusters. So even small amounts of the traces also you can you can trace out if they are tagged to the nano materials. So that is how they will be sensed. Then these 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 are some of my studies. So proline and alpha proline and beta proline, when they are tagged to the nano clusters and how Raman activity is increased and all that here it is studied. And then this is for beta proline. And this is, this is one charge based descriptor we proposed to describe the Raman activity enhancement. And there is, uh, Hedgeberg-Teller coupling constant available in the literature to study the Raman activity enhancement. So similar to that, we proposed a descriptor to study wh how, why the Raman activity is enhanced, enhancing. So we have given atomic level 
information for the Brahman activity enhancement. So then, yeah, completely. So these are all, this is how we all studied our. Not moving anything out. So these are all various studies we carried out. Okay, that's it. Friends, do we have any doubts? They are, uh, waiting for, uh, they are waiting for their lunch. Yeah. We, are, we don't have any dogs. I'm coming with the session. You can have your lunch. We will wait after one hour. After one hour. Yes. By 1 30, you must be here. Yes. <laughs> I'm 